card to you. Okay. All right. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Pop Culture Galaxy Podcast. I'm Mark Bridge. I'm here with Zach Horsner. That's me. And we're here to talk about James Bond. Now, we took a little break. We took a little break. Um, as we got to the new year, we got to the second uh, book of the, the, the Blu-ray, the box set, um, starting with Octopussy. But we're going to do something different, too. Because in the same year Octopussy came out, uh, Never Say Never Again came out with Sean Connery coming back to the role that made Bond famous. Well, yeah, I mean, it was weird because, like, Sean Connery was there. He was alive. He was 53 when he made, when, you know, this movie was made. Right. But but they, they got his dad instead, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> they got Sean Connery's dad to play James Bond. It's so odd. He said he got really, really old, huh? The Scotch yeah, man. I mean, even back in um, uh, Diamonds Are Forever, just between uh, You Only Live Twice and Diamonds Are Forever, he got hit by a ton of bricks. <laughs> Age. He just, I guess it was pre-plastic surgery for men. Right. Pre, Pre-Botox. Um, and he could have he could have used some. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, so when this movie Octopus it came out, the year it came out was uh, 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 1983. Um, I was two. <laughs> uh, uh, so Ju- June of 1983 was Octopus, and then uh, October um, of 83 uh, was Never Say Never Again. Now, directors. John Glenn directed Doctor Pussy, which was his third Bond movie. Um, maybe something like that. Yeah, his third one. Um, and then uh, uh, Never Say Never Again was directed by Irvin Kershner, which who directed Star Wars episode Episode Five, Empire Strikes Back. Yep. Yep. And RoboCop Two, which nobody likes, but I liked it. His uh, his second Bond, John Glenn's second Bond. Yeah, a second. Um, so yeah, uh, so the two movies that are, granted they didn't come out the same month, but yeah, they were battling each other. The budget for um, Octopussy was twenty-seven million, and the budget for Never Say Never Again was thirty-six. Now, who won at the at the box office? Oh, who was Octopussy. the ultimate? <laughs> Octopussy, not not, not by a like, yeah. mile. But yeah. uh, but by a reasonable enough amount, and like the fact that the budget was lower means mm-hmm. that there's just more profit to go around, and like uh, Never Say Never Again had more to prove to mm-hmm. justify its existence, mm-hmm. and alas, it did not. So uh, uh, Never Say Never Again made 160 million at the box office, and Octopussy made 187. Uh, at the box of, box office. Now, I want you to tell me, Zach. So, never say never again was made by Warner Brothers, right? It was a Warner Brothers picture. Yep. Produced by uh, um, Kevin McClor- McClory. Is his name? Yep. Yep. Kevin McClory, the infamous, the legend. So, what happened? How did this happen? How is this able to exist? Two Bond movies, separate Bond movies, by different studios. Okay, so, so we've danced around this a, a few times mm-hmm. because we were, we were really saving it for this episode. Right. Um, so a million years ago in like the <laughs> late 50s, um, Ian Fleming, I almost said Ian McKellen, I'm, <laughs> Ian Fleming right. was like, uh, hey, my James Bond novels, uh, I think I want to do a movie of them. And he goes to some producers and they're like, eh, yeah, yeah. And then he goes to Kevin McClory, and he's like, "Yes, let's do this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's do a movie, and uh, let's let's come up with some ideas." So together they come up with Thunderball, right? And they start making a movie called Thunderball. They start making a script, mm-hmm. and they make that script, and it uh, is you know partly 
the brainchild of Kevin McClory. Right. And then, you know, one thing happens, another thing happens, and they go, ah, you know what, Let, now's not the time. Let's not, let's just sit on this. Uh, let's, you know, part ways amicably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Ian Fleming is like, well, you know, we came up with some good ideas, so let me write, let me turn this screenplay that was never filmed into, into a book. A book. Mm-hmm. But, like, let me not give any kind of, like, royalties or anything to Kevin McClory. <laughs> It's just, you know, maybe out of ignorance, maybe out of uh, spite, maybe out of just uh, plain old, you know, trying to get, keep him from earning a buck. Right. Uh, but he makes the book. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they actually do start a James Bond film series. Mm-hmm. And the fourth film is Thunderball. Yep. And uh, Kevin McClory is credited as a producer on it. But... Uh, he goes, yeah, I uh, I own that. That's mine. <laughs> and Spectre is in that, so that's mine. And we came up with some ideas that would shape, would influence Spectre in the years going forward. So mm-hmm. that's mine. And there's a huge, very complicated. I don't even know all like the. It's really hard to keep track. But basically, Kevin McClory has the rights, cinematic rights, mm-hmm. to stuff like Blofeld, Spectre, and the ability to use them in his own movie. As long as that movie is essentially a remake of Thunderball. Right. And so the the plus side of that is like, you know, it's the, the way I see it, you know, the competition is good. Mm-hmm. I think everything should be in the public domain. And let Wild West it just you know if they, <laughs> everyone they say they believe in capitalism, you know let the market decide. Right. Uh, but the downside is that the Eon movies, the Eon Productions, the official Bond lineage, yeah, they can't use Spectre. Mm-hmm. They can't use Blofeld. So that's why in the, uh, the last movie that we saw, mm-hmm. uh, Blofeld appears but is not named. Mm, Blofeld, yeah. <laughs> and. You know, and they kill him off, and and Blofeld was supposed to be in The Spy Who Loved Me, right? Which was like the tenth movie, and it was supposed to be like the big blowout, bring back that villain, mm-hmm. but uh, they weren't allowed. Um, so now you've got Kevin McClory who can make his own Bond movie, mm-hmm. uh, and you've got the Eon Productions that are moving along as though um, you know they're pretending that that movie doesn't exist, right? Uh, and they kind of probably would have been able to just steamroll it had Kevin McClory not somehow I don't know how I wish I would I knew like the behind the scenes like going goings on mm-hmm. of getting the Sean Connery um, you know who is still heralded by many as you know the greatest Bond yep. of all time uh, to reprise his role mm-hmm. uh, one way or another you know in a less than official capacity but you know having Having that, having that star power is uh, much more powerful than like, we got, you know, some guy. Like the Eon Productions can get away with getting some guy because then they, they yeah. build him, shape him into Bond. Mm-hmm. But uh, like, you know, Pierce Brosnan was a TV guy. Yeah. Roger Moore was also a TV guy. Yep. Um, Daniel Craig was in Layer Cake. Uh, <laughs> You know, like you get all the they they shaped them into Bond, but Eon, uh, excuse me, Never Say Never Again came out with that that brand recognition of like who cares if it's official, unofficial, whatever. We really don't care as much as we think we do, especially pre Avengers, pre Cinematic Universe, mm-hmm. pre Marvel Studios, pre DC EU. Right. You know, um, it's just like you got Sean. All right, I'll see a Sean Connery James Bond movie. Let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And um, they and they went head to head. Yeah. Uh. So going back to Octopussy while they were casting it because they they heard because they were gonna uh, Roger Moore he's been on a film by film basis, uh, where it's like, oh, we're gonna do another Bond movie, pay me, right? Um. So, but in the meantime they were like all right maybe we we can't pay him anymore let's find let's find another bond and oh my god they always try to get an american and he just never works every time they're 
this close to casting an American, something else happens. So they had a, they even had a screen test with uh, James Brolin, Thanos' dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, James Brolin uh, screen tested with Maud Adams. Um, and you could have pulled it off, I guess. It didn't look too out there uh, from the from what the footage that they they saw. But once they heard Sean Connery was coming back, they were like, "Yeah, we can't. We need we need to bring in the big guns." Roger, you're up. <laughs> um, so they once again got Roger, uh, Roger Moore to re- to to be uh, Bond, and they brought Maude M- Adams, the only Bond girl to ever sh- be a Bond girl twice. As two different characters. Yep. Um, so she plays the title character in this movie, and she was in the previous one, right? The one. No, she was in Man, Man with the Golden Man, Gun. Yes, Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. Um, and she, I think, uh, from what I heard, she has a cameo in A View to a Kill. A cameo uh, that you will never ever be able to find. She's like in a crowd shot, oh. and like I, I've looked, I can't find her. <laughs> right. Theoretically, uh, she was on set that day, but uh, got you, know. you, got you. <laughs> All right, so the Never Say Never Again is basically based on Thunderball, so it it, it has the the same sort of uh, plot line, I guess. Like not everything's word uh, verbatim, but like if you watch Thunderball, you recognize certain things, like the the. When he went to the nursing, what was that place? A facility? Yeah, the yeah. the rehab clinic. Yeah, um, which is it's funny. It's like he's uh kind of injured, beat up in Thunderball, but yeah, it's just because he's ancient. Yeah, <laughs> they're like Bon, you gotta get rid of your free radicals, man. Yep. <laughs> oh, oh. Sh- 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 my free radical shit. Sh- sh- uh, how about uh, a herbal enema? <laughs> it's like yeah. <laughs> Oh hey, God. free love, baby. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, like there's that. Um, there's you know the whole thing with Domino and mm-hmm. her brother uh, Largo. Yeah, you know, yeah, Same he's thing. like Romanian now instead of Italian. But I think that's just because of the actor. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you know, even though it's not not our, you know, hashtag not my Blofeld. Mm-hmm. It is a Blofeld. Yeah. But hey, the, that Blofeld is played by Max von... Uh, Max von Sydow, yeah. right? Or is like... Yeah, classic villain, you know? And Lor Santeca from Force Awakens. Right. <laughs> um, but he didn't really do anything in that movie. He was just shows up and... Yeah, he doesn't do anything yeah. in this one either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird thing where it's like... Um, yeah, it's technically like based on you know Bond but it's like they're setting up sequels that they're just like come on man you know this is never gonna get yeah, made right <laughs> like this movie is a gift yeah this is your only Bond movie that you can possibly make <laughs> mm-hmm. without Eon involvement it's the only one just yeah, make and it like, yeah and, and they, they ran into that problem you know years later cause they were like oh we wanna make our own Bond movies mm-hmm. but like uh they still only had the rights to Thunderball. Right, right. Like, the, there's a script, you know, floating around on the internet called Warhead 2000 mm-hmm. that would have been directed by Roland Emmerich. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's the same story again. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's weird. So, uh, so number one in this movie, uh, was that uh, Fatima's, Fat, Fatima? Was that her? Was she number one? Or was she just, like, a henchman? No, she was, like, number 12. Okay. Or something, right. right? Um, but no, I mean Blofeld's always number one. No, I mean no. Uh, okay, he has a number two. Sorry, he's number. Remember, he always has like a no, number two. He's on a secret mission for me or something like that. Right. Um, right. But it wasn't. Yeah, I, think, I think Fatima is, is is twelve. Okay. And she's great. I mean, not like anthropologically great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like. It's like a, a white British man's understanding of what feminism is. Right, right. <laughs> He's like, oh, feminist? What, what, what is that? Is that? That's like where you hate men and like want to shoot their dicks off, right? Mm-hmm. Speak now and forever hold your peace. Which is a great line. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of like, 
Oh boy, this. <laughs> if she wasn't so a like vampishly gorgeous mm-hmm. and just delightfully cartoonishly evil, mm-hmm. um, and like she has to be that horrible so that you're not just horrified when she literally explodes. Yeah. Oh my. God. <laughs> so her, her name Fa. Oh, Fa- Fatim- Fatima Blush. <laughs> Fatima Blush. Uh, yeah, she is number 12. Um, yeah, and uh, another gr- girl he, he managed to get in bed with before he, you know, he has to, you know, he has to, he has to get his rocks off. <laughs> it's, um, even though it's a different company making it, it's still a Bond movie, so you gotta get her quota up there with, with the Bond female. Now, here's the thing. Here's, here's the tricky thing, right? For the longest. For the longest, right? So I see I see Kim, ba- Kim Basinger, right? She was in a Batman movie. As Vicky Vale. And other movies as well. And I could have sworn she was a Bond girl, right? And then I remember my first watch through of the Bond movies. I was like, I guess that was like a Ma- Mandela effect or something like that. Think- me thinking she was a Bond girl. Well... She is a Bond girl, just not in the Eon. <laughs> so movies a Mandela effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So she's she, she's fine. Yeah. So she plays Domino in this movie. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, she's fine. Yeah, she's fine. She's not. Um, there's nothing stand out, but again, it's Kim Basinger. She's always hot. She can just. Well, whatever. there is like uh, legends of like. Sean trying to trying to get a little piece of that behind the scenes, and like she, her being like, mm, 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 no, no, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you, Sean. Mm. Yes, no, 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 no. Uh, she also apparently didn't have a great time with Irving Kirshner either. Oh really? Oh, um, man. I'm not sure like the specifics of that, but I don't know. I mean, I I am. Imagine that you're either you're either on board with a Bond movie or not. Mm-hmm. It's like you kind of just have to know that this is not. Although it, it's it's weird because Domino is one of the few, not not few, but I'd say like half of Bond girls are kind of you know are are just sex objects, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then half of them get a degree of character beyond that. Yeah, yeah. And Domino is one who gets that. Mm. You know, she has that revenge story. She has that motive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they didn't really, they didn't really do that so much in this one. You know, she shoots Largo at the end, but really just out of obligation. Mm-hmm. I don't think that she, you know, I don't think it's her fault, right. but I don't think that the movie allows her to move the needle for Bond girls the way some other Bond girls, including Domino herself in Thunderball, yeah. were allowed to move that needle. Right. Um, and yeah, the other cast as well you know we i think we mentioned this off stream um felix we get our first black felix black felix <laughs> played by uh um bernie casey um and then uh we have uh edward Fox's m and it's fine <laughs> miss money penny what okay so money penny right so she's played by pamela salem in this one and again, because I watched Octopussy right before this, uh, and I saw uh, Money Penny in this again, it, it, it just like my my wires that cross is like, oh, I guess they're calling this girl the new girl the assistant in Octopussy Money Penny now. This, no, it's a totally different movie. The reason why I said that, right? To jump on Octopussy for a little bit, uh, uh, Roger Moore's James Bond walks into the room <laughs> and sees this young <laughs> voluptuous. Y- lady, <laughs> and and friends with her, thinking it's uh said why Miss Money Penny, you you're looking uh very beautiful, and then the real Money Penny comes out, which is uh Louis Maxwell, and Jesus, she uh you know she's up there, <laughs> she's up there, she's a very handsome woman yes. at that at that yeah. age, you know kind of like Bond himself, but mm-hmm. you know. Even now, you know, men are allowed to be like, "Oh, he's so like dignified and handsome," whereas with girls, ah, oh, she's an old bag. Put her, put, put yeah. her away. Put her in the, put her in the attic. Send her to the nursing home. Yeah. Uh, even I think she looks great. She looks fine. <laughs> she's a fine-looking woman. But like, uh, no, I don't like. I don't. I'm not gonna lust after her anymore. I mean, 
<laughs> Although, I mean, come on, it's me we're talking about, so I probably would. But, but that's neither here nor there with regards to this conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be... Uh, well, and we kind of ran into that problem mm-hmm. with Roger Moore, mm-hmm. uh, where some of his Bond girls are kind of like... He he could he could definitely be their dad be the, their dad yeah. which is not necessarily you know because we don't like to be ageist but mm-hmm. uh, you know it's a it's a little yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the 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 new uh, well the assistant um, let's see if I can find her name here yeah who was she come again yeah who was she I don't know yeah uh, the the assistant uh, uh, Penelope Smallbone <laughs> what the fuck. <laughs> so better small. Than small faucet like in this one but we'll get there small bone uh played by michaela uh clavel now the when you first see her she has this white top on with a black skirt a long black skirt when you see miss money penny in uh in never say never again she's wearing the same exact outfit and the same brunette but it's a different actress and it, i was like that's why i was like wait they made her the new uh, Miss Money Money Penny, and then I was like, "Oh wait, wait, wait! No, it's a new movie. It's a it's a <laughs> Warner Brothers movie." So I was like, "It was really uh, cause uh, it was just strange to seeing the two, you know, the the young Miss Money Penny first with the Miss uh, Money Penny's assistant. They look almost alike." Yeah. Um. Uh, and then uh, you have Q. She's she's actually their daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well. According to Louis Maxwell, because she was kind of like pissed off when they heard she was bringing in a younger uh, assistant, so they're like, "Is this a blatant in your face? Like, uh, Louis, you're kind of old. We need the beauty. Let's bring in a young chick." So she felt a little bit slighted, but she found out that uh, she, when Louis Maxwell used to be a model, she modeled with her mom, the 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 assistant's oh, wow. mom. Uh, That's so funny. so they had that in common I guess um and so in Never Say Never Again you had uh Q played by Alec McCowan uh introducing the the rocket pen or whatever <laughs> yeah which he blows Fa- Fatima up with um and uh yeah so this it's like I said it's not shot for shot a Thunderbolt but it you kind of follow the same projection um, even having a sort of climax in the underwater, because Thunderbolt had the climax. I'm, oh yeah. I'm right. okay. I'm trying to make make sure I remember my Bond movies. Oh yeah, that was Thunderbolt. But Thunderbolt had a better, because it had a war in underwater. This one, they're just swimming, right? It was like a. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's weird, you know. Like um, maybe it's just because I'm I'm such a huge fan of Thunderball. Mm-hmm. I'm like, even though this movie's made like, what, 15, 20 years later, mm-hmm. uh, it's like, eh, none of this is done better than it was in Thunderball. Right, right. Like, the action especially mm-hmm. is frequently very, you know, well, that's obviously a stunt double, or, or hey, they couldn't get a stunt double there? Uh, Sean Connery's a little slow on the draw. Yeah, especially when he, uh, when he was trying to lift the weight up and he uses his legs. It's clearly a younger dude <laughs> flipped up. And it had to have the camera fr- shot from behind because he was going to go from the flip up to like a, a bat to hit the, the, get hit with the bat or something like that. So it had to be move, moving fast. So it's the one shot, but you can clearly see the reason why they shot from behind is the stunt man is going to be doing the rest of the action sequence at, in that single take right there. Yeah. Um, Although maybe I'm maybe I'm being maybe I'm applying a double standard though because I don't necessarily have that problem with the Roger Moore movies mm-hmm. and he's older than Sean Connery but somehow looks younger. Um, and like Max von Sydow is only like a year older than Sean Connery, wow. which is very funny. <laughs> uh, so I guess Sean doesn't look that old. Mm-hmm. But. Um, I don't know, it's also, the, like, just the audacity of the stunts. Mm-hmm. Like, with Sean Connery, it's, like, it's a little more plausible that right. a person could do these things. Mm-hmm. But in, um, you know, any given Roger Moore movie, or even the Sean Connery ones from, you know, the real ones, <laughs> um, you know, it's, like, hanging outside of planes and doing insane stunts that you just can't even imagine until they're real. I mean, the first scene in Octopussy... Um, 
you know that whole thing with the little the little plane is just amazing. Yep, yep. Uh, because the thing is, they didn't have computers back then to kind of erase like wire work or any pole, but they just smartly put uh fins uh plane fins and then the car was moving that fast anyway so because once you move move the the, move that scene in a certain speed you can see the pole but it's in regular speed it's moving so fast you can't see the pole and of course you can't see the car that's driving the the plane and and like even if you can see it it still looks awesome and then speaking of stunts so the sequence at the in, in octopusy at the plane when you have uh Roger Moore's character, uh, James Bond, on top of the plane. There was a whole shot where you could clearly see it's a stunt man facing Especially everything. On Blu-ray. Yeah. <laughs> on like you know, 40, 50 inch screen, and you're just like, yeah, that's yeah. a guy. Yeah. But you're like, at least it's a guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's, it's a real person up there. And it's in the air and everything. And you, you could see when he, he hit uh, Indian Jaws off the plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, he clearly had, clearly yeah, had the parachute on, parachute. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, they, still they managed to um do some crazy sequences, in, uh, sequences in Octopussy and crazy stunt work, especially with the fight choreography. Um, and then uh, so then let's let's talk about the uh, Octopussy for a little bit. You know, uh, some of the cast. You know, Maude Adams again uh, playing the title character. Then you have great. I love her so much. <laughs> Then you have uh, Louis Jor- Jordan playing Kam- uh, Kamal Khan. He's the bad guy, the main bad guy, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, then you have um, oh, Stephen Burkoff as General Orlov. Man, that guy is just born to play a villain. <laughs> yeah. Because I think he was a villain in Rambo Three, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken right? Um, was it three or two? Two. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 He's great. Um, he's a very scary, scary guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is this? It's interesting though. He was he played sort of the number two villain in this one, the one that dies earlier in the movie. Mm. And uh, one of the, you know, one of the few times Bond actually goes up against a Russian. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny because like you know, the Spy Who Loved Me has the East West relationship, and it's kind of understood that he's always going up against Russians. Mm-hmm. But up until that point, he almost never does. Yeah. yeah. And this has him, but you know he's he's rogue. He's not representing like the Russians, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. And even um, General Gogol's just like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. yeah, no, thank you. Uh, sums up with the Mikey kind of went like transformer y. <laughs> oh, oh, testing one two. How, how's this? It's still a little bit. What about what about now? Am uh, I better? Yeah, better. Okay, um, I don't I don't know. Maybe it's had a momentary lapse. Going back to it again, is it like a short or something? No, I don't think so. Test, test one two. Eh, it's good now. Um, uh, yeah, I, we mentioned Lewis Maxwell. She's back as Miss Money Penny. Um, VJ, I think he's a tennis. Was a tennis player or something like that. Yeah, he was a real life uh, tennis guy. Yeah, uh, he was cast as his. Uh, Felix like character, <laughs> but yeah. not Felix. Um, who else did we have? Oh, what's the name of the actual other Bond girl that's super sexy? Is that, that's um, Bianca? Is that her, right? The and, one in like the first half. Yeah, the one who did the rollout on the um with her dress. She kind of rolled out and flipped off the balcony. Oh, um. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's her. Uh, is it Mag- It's not Magna, is it? Um. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally is Magda. Yeah. Uh. So played by Christina, Wayborn. She was. She's a Swedish actress. Um. See, yep. You see. Yeah. She shows. Well. She shows a lot of skin compared to most Bond girls. Yeah. Yeah. She's very memorable. Yeah, cause she um she's a she, they cast her because she was athletic and she had a model esque look. Um, they said they saw a poster of her posing with a tiger and they showed it behind the scenes, and holy crap! Yeah, I could you would definitely want her to be in a Bond movie, 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that uh, after after <laughs> this after the stream. You know, for research purposes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, but yeah, she uh, she got her you know licks into you know she did the flip like I said she did the flip off the balcony. Um, and this one was shot in India, uh, both some of it other than in the Pinewood in London. Uh, they shot on location in India, which was, according to them, hot as shit. <laughs> mm, I bet. Um, and they were, I don't know what is with the Bond productions, both this one and Never Say Never Again, why they, like, snakes, I just don't want to see, I don't want to be around snakes, I would never be around snakes. <laughs> I just get the heebie-jeebies every time I see snake on screen. Like, uh, seeing a person next to a snake, it just, oh. And they were playing. There was a behind the scenes of uh, VJ, right? He had the cobra in the basket. And Roger Moore was there beside him. And every time Roger Moore, she, he was playing with him, like, bang, hitting the, the basket, like, to antagonize the snake. I'm like, Roger, do you realize that's a cobra in the basket? Why would you do that? Because he's James Bond. Like he's just playing. It's like, oh my god! And as soon as they open the thing, the bo- the 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 basket, you could see the cobra in attack mode. Right? It's like, oh my god! I can't, I can't with snakes. No. And then both movies had snakes in them. Maybe Roger Moore is just like secretly super fearless probably is <laughs> yeah but it's just like i just oh, i couldn't i couldn't <laughs> yeah um Octop- and, you, know, you gotta mention uh, the the two knife guys oh yes the the, the um, twins <laughs> um i like we haven't really gotten to this yet but i really like octopussy i think it is like maybe the most underrated mm-hmm. bond movie yeah you uh, know you know what it felt like too because I think uh, it felt like they kind of scale back a little bit. Um, even though I would love, I say I love the colors. The color of this movie was like vibrant colors. I mean, you get it's, it's you come with the territory once you go to India, right? It's so much vast colors over there, and I think they took advantage of that. Um, and if it, it feels more like a scale back movie in terms of set pieces, but it still had the adventure feeling to it. I would say, um, even though if you look at the climax, it's just they're on a plane, fighting on a plane. <laughs> yeah, it's like that, and like the the train. It actually gives me. Um, I mean, this is post Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Uh no. Uh, Raiders came out in eighty one. This is eighty three. Yeah, so it's so it's after. So I could definitely. Oh, sorry, sorry. Like, uh, I'm I'm thinking pre. <laughs> yeah, post. <laughs> the... I could definitely see them being like, oh. Raiders clearly yeah. inspired by Bond. Yeah, yeah. Let's kind of pay that forward. Mm-hmm. Although Harrison Ford has not yet dressed like a clown, <laughs> right? Which, you know, we have to, we have to at least touch on. You know, it's it comes late enough in the movie uh-huh. that you're either in or you're out by that point. Uh-huh. But like, it's really silly. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't derail the movie, mm-hmm. but it's kind of like Bond is. Just as a clown, wearing the shoes, mm-hmm. wearing the hat, and he's just like, "There's a bomb. There's a there's a nuclear bomb in this." Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but at that point, you know, it's just like, eh, whatever. It's fun. Mm-hmm. I'd be disappointed if he wasn't wearing a clown, yep. clown makeup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's trying to be the Joker. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, we can't talk about. Uh, a Bond movie and not mention the stunt work in this one and if you don't get out of this place before the nuclear bomb goes off you get what you fucking deserve <laughs> I just saw that movie the other night which I one? I just saw Joker oh right 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's a whole other conversation yeah. it wasn't so bad I mean so it, it's very polarizing and I'm like I feel like it's a movie where you see what you see mm. you see what you want to see in that movie which is kind of cool very mm. more shaky right but anyway yeah, so see, um, what I was saying about uh, um, the stunt work. So the the stunt work, while uh, Bond was on the train, the side of the train, the stunt man actually got injured in that one, and they showed footage of it too, where, because you know you have the little railings on the side of the uh, tracks, like just some railing, like 
once in a while when you pass it. And I guess they didn't know it was coming up so soon, so it <laughs> clipped the, the the hip of uh, the stuntman, shattered his hip, and dug out his flesh. And he's just like, and he still, and he sprained his arm because he kind of got um, lifted in the air. And they showed the footage of that. I'm like, oh my god, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, they they always outdo themselves with stunt work. And if somebody doesn't get injured on a Bond movie, <laughs> then the Bond movie is not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it kind of comes with the territory because every Bond movie, you know, kind of like, like Never Say Never Again, it's like the thing that it's missing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like, no, all, all they did was, I mean, did they kill that horse? Did that horse die? It, that looked like a fake horse that just fell in the water. <laughs> it, was, it was a real horse. Oh, my God. Uh, and I, I, I know that that was controversial. I don't know if it was injured, but I do know that people were not happy that they threw a horse off a cliff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Granted, they threw stuntmen off as well, but, like, you know, the stuntmen were paid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that goes kind of... I don't, even, I don't know if it was true at this point in, you know, Hollywood history or, you know, British Hollywood, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they said that the culture of, like, stunt guys was kind of like, I'll give you, you know, 500 bucks extra if you do this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, half of them were like, uh, no thanks. And half of them were like, yeah, all right, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of how they decided who would do stuff. Right. Um, I don't know if that was true at that point, but, uh, you know, you can't make that offer to a horse. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, it's like, so, so I, I I don't know, but I do know I do remember that that was like a controversial thing. Okay, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I guess because I wouldn't believe they would do that to a real horse. It just like looks like a fake horse just dropping in that water. But jeez, if that's real, oh my god. Um, but so I guess let's talk a little bit about the plot because. We know Never Say Never Again because we talked about Thunderball. So it's just pr- practically the same thing. So the plot of what Octopussy is, uh, uh, one of their agents found uh, the, an egg. Uh, or was, Right. It's yeah. like a thing of Fabergé eggs. Yeah. And like they're fake or they're real. And like the Octopussy gang uh-huh. is being used as like mercenaries to steal them to fund General Orlov's secret war. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's not nonsense. It is very complicated, but mm-hmm. it's a, it's one of those like, it's not. It, it's kind of like a Hitchcock style. Like it doesn't matter. It, it it's it's a reason to get from one one action scene to the next. Right, right. Um, like some Bond movies are very straightforward, very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, like this guy's a bad guy, go get him. Mm-hmm. Some of them are like straight up spy movies like we'll get to with um uh the living daylights Mm -hmm. and this is kind of in the middle where it's like there's a lot going on Mm -hmm. but if you're a kid or just super stoned Mm -hmm. it's like it doesn't matter you're gonna have a good time don't worry about it right right (laughs) that guy fell on a bed of nails that's that's and then the indian guy goes get off my bed and you're just like is that racist oh that that and uh (laughs) When Roger Moore told VJ, is it VJ? He gave him a bunch of cash. He says, "Oh yeah, you be swimming in a lot of Corey in the future." He's like, "That's gotta be racist. That that that's racist." Pretty racist. Like they, they, that that whole scene. I mean, it's one of those things where it's an awesome scene. It's like some great action and some great stunts in that that you know, fighting through the square mm-hmm. scene. Especially the you know the chase on the the little the little I don't know what those vehicles are called the little tut tut golf cart right. type things mm-hmm. um, where it's just like you you know if it's a Bond movie and it goes into your town I feel like if they're not exploiting all of your stereotypes mm-hmm. then then they're doing it wrong right like. Um, when he goes to New York, he needs to be called a honky by a pimp. <laughs> like, if that doesn't happen, then you're doing it wrong. Right. Like, it's gotta be, like, the theme park version of whatever town you're in. Mm-hmm. And, like, I guess 
you know, by the 90s movies, they tone that down. Yeah, yeah. But, although even, you know, they do, you know, the, the tank chase version of that. You know, because he drives the tank through the actual St. Petersburg. Right. Which is so awesome. And it's like, because it's James Bond, they've been waiting to do this for 30 years by that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, is it insensitive? Yeah. Is it offensive? Eh, I mean, insofar as any Bond movie can really be offensive, like, it's, it's a theme park version of a spy movie. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's, it's gotta be, you know, it's tongue-in-cheek enough that it's not like, we are desecrating your culture. Right. Even though the British did that to the Indians. But that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, not to be an apologist, or uh, a non-apologist, I guess I should say. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's Bond. You're, you come to have a good time. You don't come for some cultural sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's Bond for you. Um, yeah, so, theme songs. Oh, my God. Rita Coolidge. <laughs> All time high. That was my favorite All when time. I was a kid. And I didn't even realize how graphic the lyrics were. <laughs> it is it is very dirty. So you have Rita Coolidge All Time High for Octopussy and you have Never Say Never Again. Um by uh who sings that one? Uh I have no idea and I don't care because it kinda stinks. Yeah, this like it was okay, I guess. Um, ooh, James Warner did the score? Nice, wait. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, it was his uh, first no. choice. It was the first Sean choice. Con- Sean Connery, uh, uh, kicked him out. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. Vetoed. Because he was American. <laughs> yeah. Vetoed the American. Yeah, that sucks, man. Um. Yeah, and, like, the, the score itself in that movie is kind of... It never said ever again. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's a weird movie because it's, it's like extremely nineteen eighty three. It's more like Blade Runner. Yeah, it's just like because it 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 has Bond in it. He says my name is Bond, James Bond in it, but it just doesn't feel like Bond because it just. As a matter of fact, I noticed right when it came to the love scenes in this movie. They lingered a lot m- longer because they were like, "All right, this is our Bond movie. You're gonna actually see some love making." Like <laughs> other Bond movies, they just cut to a uh, post-coital, right? Post post-coitus. But this one is like they're doing that weird, <laughs> uh, especially in the boat sequence. It's like that weird like transition with the two of them and they're sliding down and they're rolling around and shit like that um, with uh, Fatima and. In the Bond, um, but yeah. Uh, so who sings? Was it? Uh, what's the name of the freaking song? I'm it trying to see. Lenny Hall. Right. Lenny, Lenny, Lonnie. Yeah. And let's see. And I don't know. I don't know her at all. I don't think. I don't think I know her. Yeah, I don't know her. Um. <laughs> nothing, nothing against her. Yeah. I just don't know any of her. Uh, apparently, apparently, they offered it to Bonnie Tyler, but she hated the song, so she declined. How has Jim Steinman not written a Bond song yet? Uh, but, like, come on, Jim <laughs> Stein, like, get Meatloaf to sing that. Yeah, it's past his time. They're getting new. They're getting. Yeah, yeah, they're getting. They get, they're they're going younger. Them. They're getting younger and younger, <laughs> younger. Next, the next Bond movie after after this one, No Time to Die, is gonna be sung by a child. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, Billie Eilish. It's you say you because because you haven't heard it yet. I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. I'm waiting for the movie. I'm waiting for the movie. Yeah, I I like it. It sounds it sounds like a Bond movie, and it's it's uh the song is arranged by. Hans Zimmer, so it was pretty cool. And uh, Ron uh, and Ron Mars, that's his name, Ron Mars from the Smiths. Yeah, I, I don't know the Smiths. Okay, uh, he's he plays guitar white. in there. <laughs> yeah, a little, little Smiths humor. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I will say that you know, I liked All Time High when I was a kid, but I've kind of been like, all right, this is corny as hell now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't. That it's one of them songs that doesn't feel like a Bond song either, but it's like there. It's like that and 
nobody does it. It just feels like outliers to me when it comes to Bond songs, but whatever. Well, I, I love Nobody Does It Better, but um, like I, I think with with All Time High, it's very, it's two eighties, right? <laughs> and not in like an endearing way, like a View to a Kill, right? It's like, like All Time High sounds kind of like the theme song from like a porn parody of Bond. <laughs> Got it, like exactly. And that's not a knock against the sax. It's the sax is good. It's just a lot. <laughs> Speaking of sax, there was a lot of sax in <laughs> in Never Say Never Again. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, another yeah. sax. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, eighty three. Yeah, eighty three was moving. I think he was moving away from the dis- disco era into more of the 80s style music so it's, it still had the mashup the, the all time high it had the kind of like that bass line of early 80s mm. but because well, it's, it's like a 70s soul thing but with yeah. like that 80s instrumentation where it's like synth bass and yeah. the really weird you know ex- just different mixing of the instruments makes the sax just so obnoxious yeah. like yeah. it sounds cheap by today's ear mm-hmm. and i feel like even by by i guess it was just it was what was hip in the 80s mm-hmm. but by like 70s standards and by today's standards mm-hmm. it just sounds so cheap yeah yeah um but you know in general i do like um i like that score i i, I like i like octopus he does the tarzan yeah yeah, it was a good movie. Yeah, I enjoyable. It was enjoyable. I I, I enjoyed. I actually enjoyed both. Uh, to be honest, um, uh, uh, never say never again. It was, um, like I said, uh, it felt weird. Never say never again felt weird because it just didn't have that Bond vibe to it. But then you know it was just good to see <laughs> Connery back again and just I I was just wondering how he sort of felt kind of i mean i guess if you're a stage actor where you kind of do the same play over and over each night like doing a movie that resembles a movie you did in the 60s that's right correct right? yeah 60s well, yeah it, it's a thing where, where for him because he had said that he would never play bond again yeah yeah which is like where the title comes from uh, and that's what i'm saying it's a it's an added layer is that you're doing a movie you practically did already you're remaking yeah. thunderball <laughs> um but just i guess uh on a different uh, spectrum of his life he's a lot older so it the, the, the entire beginning of that movie took into account his age i guess where they're talking about eh, should you be a double o <laughs> yeah and then they kind of just forget about it and yeah it's like eh, we're having a good yeah they went from should you be a double o and at the end of the movie they were like the fate of the entire uh Majesty's uh, uh, palace <laughs> depends on you, or whatever. Yeah. Oh, speaking of, and that guy, Mr. Bean, he was in it. Yeah. Rowan, Rowan, Mr. Bean. Uh, Rowan, Mr. Small Fawcett, Rowan yeah. Atkinson. Yeah. One of the first on-camera interviews that I did at Screen Rant. Oh, nice. Yeah, he was there. I still had my my book, notebook back then because I was <laughs> too nervous to just go in with everything in my head yeah which still every once in a while I'm like oh I was gonna ask you something so good but it just poof yeah, yeah. Out of my head. Um, but like you know I'm kind of quick enough now that I can say something at least yeah but he was, but he was like oh I see you have your little book there and I was like <laughs> yes alright <laughs> cause that's, they're saying not to do that right like I guess when you're interviewing act, act, uh, anyone I guess they don't it's frowned upon to have your I don't I don't think it is because like I see it on TV. Oh on yeah, TV, me too. Um, and like I see people who, not who I necessarily like and respect, yeah, right, okay. but who are well known. Right. Uh, not to name any names, uh, but like people who you know are like on TV and stuff, mm-hmm. who I see and are just like writing stuff down before the interview, and I was like, huh. Yeah. It's so fun. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna be talking to him for like four minutes. Mm-hmm. Or are you writing so much? <laughs> are you gonna be like rapid fire? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I guess there are options, right? It's like, which one yeah. can I get to? Oh, I like this one. Or 
if they mention something that already answers another question that you had down here, you can move on to the next. Yeah, I, I mean, if I was doing it for like sixty minutes, yeah, either for that duration of time or for that TV program, then I'd have I'd have some notes written down. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I kind of jot stuff down on my phone and then kind of you know just have it in my head. But, yeah, yeah. But whatever. So Ron Atkinson, uh. Kind of in this movie for no reason. Yeah, right? Because he just disappeared for like a good chunk of it and comes back at the end of the movie, too. Uh, you know who he reminds me of? In Casillo and Royale, the, the guy who... Uh, um, like, in terms of just his presence, the one who... Uh, I guess uh, Bond gave the account number to, or the, the funds, and then oh, he yeah. shows up at the end and... Yeah, that guy. Right? It kind of reminds me of that guy. I can't believe we've been talking about this movie for this long and haven't talked about Bond playing freaking Atari. So yes, that's the next thing I wanted to get to. So this movie came out in '83, like right when the video game crash happened. Yeah, so I think this movie became ancient immediately. Yeah, right. As like, were they trying to tap into the okay? Now we're, this is a video game culture. Let's tap into that audience. It's it, they're trying the to. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> I was like, okay, so the character, uh, uh, Magna, I think, yeah, she opens the, the, the this door and she goes into an arcade. <laughs> and I was, wait, is that an arcade box right there? What is happening? It's like all the, all the Atari branding everywhere. It's like in this like high-end casino. Right. You know, it's supposed to... Cause Will you be playing Kaboom today, sir? Because, <laughs> you know, when you think of Bond, you think of high-class... Casinos and Baccarat. Yeah, you know, and then not video games. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I mean it is whatever is like hip. Yeah. But it usually sticks to actual gambling. Right. Like, you know, in Casino Royale, I forget what they play in the the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like they play Texas Hold'em in the movie right. because that's a much more popular game by 2006. Mm-hmm. Um. But it's funny because they were like, hey, maybe these video game uh, things will take off. And they kind of did, but not in, right. not in, not among that crowd. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if they, they, they held off until 85, maybe. Because that's when original Nintendo came out, right? 85? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe or if they held off. Something up. like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a bit later, like a bit later in the States. Might have been 86, 87. Probably. Number came out with like a ton of the games. Mm-hmm. Like a ridiculous launch lineup in in America. Yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, that was super weird. Um, and the game itself looks terrible. Yeah, I was like, what is that? <laughs> and it took me a while to understand. Okay, what what what's that? So are they getting burned while they're playing the game? Yeah, there's like some shots. Yeah, right. Because I feel because I thought I thought what was happening is that. Uh, for instance, if um, Bond loses that round, he gets a shot. But then later on, it looks like while they were fighting each other, their sticks were getting hot at the same time. So that's where I got confused a little bit. Um, maybe, maybe something like yeah. that. It's 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 ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, not the best. You know, it's one of those things where it's like I get I get it. They didn't want to do the traditional card. Scene. Yeah. But it's like, that's Bond. Yeah. You're gonna put him in a tuxedo. Don't yeah. make him play video games. Yeah, yeah that was <laughs> weird. I play video games all the time. But uh, I'm not gonna wear a tuxedo to play them. Although that would probably be a fun stream. Probably, could probably try that. What do you, th- what do you think if you if a Bond movie now had him playing video games? I didn't play Fortnite. Oh God. No. Um, uh, like ninjas there, and he's just like. So, do you need any tips? <laughs> He's like, oh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> wow, well, he, he beat my score in Fortnite. <laughs> oh my I God. mean, that is kind of what Bond would do. Yeah, I mean, because that's like the um, uh, dying of the day when he gets in like the supersonic car. He's mm. like, hey, boss, beat your time. He's yeah. like, oh, shut up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, if Bond gets, like, a million years. Okay, so many, many years ago, James Bond uh, from Russia with Love was on the cover of Game Informer mm-hmm. with Sean Connery. Yeah. yeah. And the, one of the quotes that I remember to this day with the developers is they say, 
when Indiana Jones finds a helicopter, you go, oh boy, I wonder if he can fly that thing. Mm-hmm. And when James Bond finds a helicopter, you go, not only can he fly that thing, he can fly it better than the person who put it there in the first place. Right. So, like, whatever it is, Bond, like, should be good at it. Mm. Like, Bond will pick up Fortnite. I, I'm actually kind of surprised Bond hasn't done a crossover thing with Fortnite yet. Next month. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's probably... I wouldn't be shocked to see a, a Bond skin in Fortnite. The shaken, um, not stirred season. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I guess... I mean, is there anything else like we can say about these two movies? Yeah, you know... Octopussy 1, but not by much. Uh, story-wise, you would say... You would give it to Octopussy over... Yeah, oh, oh I, I would definitely give literally every single point to Octopussy. Some some would be closer than others. I don't hate uh, Never Say Never Again, mm-hmm. but it is kind of a nothing movie to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like as soon as I'm done with it, I'm just like, what did I just do? Yeah. For the last two hours and 15 minutes? Mm-hmm. Um, and Octopussy, like, the last time the last time I saw Octopussy was in the movies. Yeah. I went to the Alamo Draft House to see it. <laughs> and uh, I took my mom because she loves Roger Moore, which is probably where I get it from. Right. But um, it was really cool because, uh, you know, watching those stunts on the big screen, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of not a homebody, but I am definitely not as much of a theater maniac as I am for, like, I love putting my headphones on, turning the lights out, and just watching a movie by myself. Mm hmm. Um, but there was a special joy in watching that movie with, like, you know, some parents who brought their kids and, like, some old people who watched it, you know, in the movies probably and some Bond fanatics. Mm -hmm. And it's like all those stunts on the big screen are just elevated. Right, right. It's like, you know, it's why you watch Mission Impossible movies in IMAX, Mm -hmm. you know? It's uh, that scale that Bond does, even when it's not a great Bond movie, Mm-hmm. Um, there will always be those scenes that are just like, you know, everyone cheers. Everyone cheers when he flies the plane through that through the little tiny mm-hmm. gap in the doors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when he's fighting that guy on top of the plane, he drops the cannon on the guy's head. Just, <laughs> it's like, there's no blood, but it's like, oh my god, you know he just like smashed that guy's skull into a thousand pieces. Yep. <laughs> Uh, driving the driving the car on the uh, the train tracks. Yeah, like you know, there's an energy in James Bond that is just not not in other movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Octopussy has that. Never seen ever again. Doesn't really have it. No. It has Sean Connery. They're like you can have Sean Connery, or you can have a uh, stunt budget. Yeah. So, like, you choose Connery. Yeah. So yeah. Um... Those two movies came out, did their thing. Uh, um, okay, okay, so to wrap this up now, how did it, how did everything sort of get rectified? Because like I said, like you mentioned, oh, it yeah. wasn't until it wasn't until uh, Spectre that yeah, they could use it wasn't Spectre, until right? Spectre that everything got cleared up. Yeah, but but the the pieces were being set, put in place before then. Is yeah, because like. So that was like 97, I think, was when they started the process of kind of someone's buying someone and, you know, selling the rights to whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, Kevin McClory had been staking his Hollywood reputation on this movie. Mm-hmm. And when it kind of came and went without much fuss, didn't, I don't think it lost anybody money. Right. But it didn't make as much money as, you know, it didn't springboard into a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and he, he tried again, but the movies were never made. Like, apparently he, he wanted to do one with Timothy Dalton. Yeah. Would have been crazy. Uh, apparently Liam Neeson was also in contention at one point to be Bond <laughs> in the 90s. Um, but it just never, never happened. Eventually, he kind of, either by giving up or by being broke, yeah, kind of sold the stake back yeah. um, to one company or another. And then that company would be acquired by MGM. Mm. Um and first it was Casino Royale which isn't a McClory joint yeah but like first MGM kind of got the rights back to that yeah and then at around the same time ish they started pursuing getting the rights to Blofeld and 
uh, Spectre, and you can see it in Casino Royale, because they're like, there's the organization in that. Yeah. And you're just like, anyone with a clue knows that it's obviously going to be Spectre and Blofeld, mm -hmm. even though they didn't have the rights yet. Right. And you can see that in, like, video games, mm -hmm. where it's, you know, quantum, mysterious <laughs> quantum organization. Yeah. Which, in Quantum of Solace, is never named. Yeah, it did. They yeah. say it's like the game of that. Yeah. And maybe on like the back of the box <laughs> of, the, of the movie, of like the DVD case or something. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, even then they were like, we don't want to say too much because we have to wait for the rights to clear. Mm -hmm. It's like, we've got the missile, but we can't launch it until we get permission. Yep. <laughs> um, and then as soon as that cleared through, as soon as it passed through, they were like, Okay, 007 Legends. <laughs> uh, that video game that had Spectre and had Blofeld, and you're just like, oh boy. <laughs> that was a mess. But then, you know, right after that, it was... Not only do we have Blofeld and Spectre back, we are naming the next... Movie Spectre, right? It's like, uh, bang! In your face, Spectre. <laughs> unfortunately, the movie didn't quite turn out the way that we had hoped, but um, first half is really good. First half is really good. Yeah, we'll see. We'll get there. All right, so uh, that's that should bring us uh, to the close of this podcast. Like I said, enjoyed both movies, one more than the other, obviously. And then uh, next time we'll be talking about Roger Moore's a final movie. Uh, it's his final movie, right? Uh, yeah. A View to Kill. Um, I want to talk about a view to a kill? <laughs> that's my. I can't. I, Oh, uh, Chris, Christopher Walken is is the main bad guy in that one. Like, yeah, and yeah. I can't I can't do the impression. <laughs> I can't. I've tried. I have like stood in front of the mirror for like a long time, minutes at a time, being like a view to a kill. And it's like no, nothing. I just sound like a schmuck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. To the pop culture galaxy. <laughs> Yeah, you almost had it right there. You almost, almost had it. Almost, but like, oh, right. I, and everyone I know can do like a way better version. Well, I can't do it. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, so can't wait to talk about that one. Uh, oh, yeah. We'll get there. Uh, Duran, baby. Yeah, I love that song. Um, all right, so uh, where can people find you, Zach? You can find me at my name, Zach Wojner, on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram at Zach Woj. And you can read my work on uh, ScreenRant.com, and you can catch me streaming on uh, Pop Culture Galaxy on Twitch and maybe YouTube, depending on how things work out soon. Sweet. Uh, and you can find me uh, on Twitter at Marky Tundra. You can find me on Instagram at Pop Culture Galaxy, and Facebook at Pop Culture Galaxy. So, uh, and then uh, hit that thumbs up and that like button and that subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Um, follow us on Twitch. Uh, and until next time, folks, I want to say peace. Peace.